I love them, and I know you will love them. East meets West. Please welcome Ethnotech. Thank you. Thank you. All right, here we go, here we go. Testing, am I on, am I on, I'm not on, are we on? Am I on? I'm not on. I don't know if I'm on, am I on? Not on. Am I on? There, I'm oh, yeah, on now. We Here okay. we go. Ready? Yeah. Yenal, yenal, aji yenare. Once upon a time. Mukashi, mukashi, aru tokoro ni. A long time ago. No ung unang panahon. And far, far away. These are the words that invite you into the magic of stories. And as there are stories everywhere in the world, there's a once upon a time in every language. So the first you heard was spoken in Korean. Yenal, yenal, ajiennare. The second in Japanese. Mukashi, mukashi, arutokoro ni. And the third in Filipino. Noong unang panahon. Welcome to our show, and we're going to start off um, at things like in the beginning, right? Yes, the same as Mara. We're going to start with the origin myth. And as you can tell from hers, it's going to tell you just how certain things got to be the way they are today. And, and this story is this. from Cambodia. And, and it, it is called, called Trouble Talk. Puata U A. Puata U A. Puata U A. Once upon a time. As the Hmong people of Cambodia tell it, Tu Chang Chang, the heavens created everything. And when Tu Chang Chang, the heavens created everything, why, all living things could talk with all other living things. There, there was, was only one, one talk, and, and the, the talk, talk was good. good. There was, however, one creature who was very different. <laughs> no fang, no feathers, no claws, no wings. <laughs> Walking on two legs with this crazy ego thing. Uh -huh. Look at me. I can walk, I can run, I can jump, I can dance. One day, you guessed it, human. Was walking down by the river when he met up with Mr. Fish. Say, Mr. Fish, look at me. Uh, I can walk. What can you do? <laughs> I can swim. Oh, I bet I could do that too. Oh, you think so? Well, after all, I am human, the most powerful creature. <gasps> oh, oh yo. Trouble, trouble talk. talk. Say, Mr. Fish. I bet that I could, uh, oh, I could swim better than you could walk. Oh, yeah? I bet I can walk better than you can swim. Let's, Let's have, have a, a little contest. contest. If I can swim. If I can walk better, better than, than you, you. I get to eat. I get to eat. All the fish. All the humans I, I want. want. Splash! The contest was on and human plunged in the river and <gasps> human could swim. Side stroke, back stroke. Front stroke, but all the while fish swam circles around human, just bubbling with laughter. Blah, 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 you call that swimming? Ha ha! Watch this. It's my turn to walk. Fish leaped out of the water, landed on the ground, stood on his own two hind fins, and flop. Gasping, gasping at the gills, for he was truly a fish, fish out of. of See, Mr. Fish, from now on, we humans get to eat all the fish we want. <laughs> and unfortunately, they do. Ah, you see, I am more powerful than you. <laughs> oh, yo, oh, yo, trouble talk. Trouble talk was spoken in paradise for the very first time. Now, it just so happened that <whistles> birds saw the whole thing. Silly humans, stupid fish, do they not know what real power is? After all, look at me, I can fly. And that makes, and that makes me more powerful than, oh, oh you, Grr, tiger. Nonsense. My powerful fangs, my jaws, my claws. I'm the most powerful creature here. Let's, Let's have, have a, a little, little contest. contest. Do you see that tree over there? Indeed, there was a tree rooted deep in the earth with towering tall branches. A little contest to see who can make that tree move. Whoever wins gets, gets to, to bite, bite off, off the, the other's, other's tail. tail. I'll go first. So Tiger charged at the tree. He clawed at the bark. He tried to make that tree move, but... The tree stood absolutely still. My turn. Tweeted the bird. My turn. And a tiny little bird flitted to the top of the tree and landed so lightly upon the tiniest of twigs. The tiny little bird began to bounce. The twig it burst on, it began to bounce. 
And nearby twigs and branches, they began to bounce and swing and sway until the whole tree was bouncing up and down, back and forth, all because of a little bird bouncing lightly upon a tiny of twigs. You see, you better watch out for me. Grrr, tiger lost the contest. And that's why to this very day, whenever you see a tiger prowling about in an open field of grass, the tiger crouches down really low to the ground. That's because actually, He's hiding from bird. <laughs> and that's also why tigers tuck their tails between their legs for fear that bird might swoop down and peck off their tail. Peck! <laughs> you see, I am more powerful than you. Oy, oh, trouble talk. Trouble. 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 Soon all the creatures, big and small, were talking trouble. Sharper. Faster. Bigger. Stronger. I'm more, more powerful, powerful than, than you. Suddenly. <laughs> Excuse me. <laughs> oh, it's human picking his teeth with a fishbone. You want power? I'll show you power. You puny two legs? Meet me on top of the hill tomorrow morning and I'll show you what real power is. Is. <laughs> 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 yeah, yeah. All the animals laughed hysterically at the thought of puny two legs showing them power. <laughs> but they were curious. And so one by one, the animals gathered at the top of the grassy hill at the break of dawn. And just as the morning light cast its hue upon the rainforest, just as the morning flowers bloomed the fragrance in the air, and a cloud rolled gently in a blue sky, the animals on top of that grassy hill gazed out upon the splendor of nature. And it was so beautiful. It was so peaceful that for one brief moment they stopped their bragging and they stopped their boasting. And together they remembered, oh, we truly live in a beautiful world. <sighs> when suddenly there was a sound. What's Puny Two Legs doing? Who? Clicking two stones, blowing a pile of dry grass with sparkling light, orange, red, yellow, plumes of smoke swirling up. What kind of power is this? The animals had never seen this kind of power before. Oh, the sparkling lights were pretty. The sparkling lights were bright and warm. And then human clicked the stones on the dry grass around that grassy hill as the sparkling lights grew taller and warmer, and taller, and hotter, to horribly hot fire! The flames swept across the rainforest. And the animals fled in terror, and, and the, the world, world burned, and burned, and burned. And burned. And burned. <sighs> Shh! Du Chang Chang. The heavens sent the rains to quell the flames, and the clouds to cool the earth. All the animals gathered, for they had destroyed paradise. They had destroyed their only world. Oh, they had all been saved, but everyone was changed for the deer. The deer were quick, and though they leaped to the smoke first, their coats were now tan brown by the intense heat of the fire forever, forever to, to this, this day. day. And the elephants charged through the flames. <laughs> and their once long hair was singed short, and their skin left dry and cracked. Forever, forever to, to this day. day. And the tigers slammed against the ba burning bamboo trees. And that's why tigers are charred and burnt black with stripes. Forever, forever to, to this day. Tu Chang Chang spoke. Your charred bodies, your scars, and the wounds of your stripes will forever be a painful reminder of your foolish talk. And with a heavenly sigh, <sighs> to Chang Cheng, the heavens returned paradise to us, gave us all another chance, and once again, all living things could talk with all other living things. There, there was, was only one talk, talk and, and the, the talk, talk was good. good. Except... All creatures from now on stay clear away from human. For human, your talk has been most troubling of all. And human, you will suffer great loneliness in this world until you understand what real power is forever, forever to, to this, this day. day. 
Only one, lonely one, what have you done, lonely one? Only one, lonely one, what have we done, lonely one? We wonder where we've all come from. We wonder who we will be. Um, you know, Nancy and I have been working together for 38 years plus. We've been married 38 years and creating together. <laughs> Thank you. Um, and it's really, it's the al alchemy of working together. It really creates a, a creative chemistry. Um, uh, Nancy's very good at the details, very, <laughs> very organized and precise. And I'm more the goofy, in fact, she calls me her joy boy. And a lot of times, you know, I, as I was growing up, uh, Laughter was such a, uh, an easy thing for me to, to exude and create in people. And when I became an adult, I thought I needed to disregard joy because that's not serious enough. That's not grown up. But reclaiming that joy, um, I discovered many stories. As this story from the Jataka tradition of India. Everyone say Jataka. Jataka. <laughs> Teaching stories of India, and it is called Great Joy. The farmer worked very hard, tilling the soil in the hot sun, the blazing sun and the torrential rain. And you know the life of a farmer can be very hard. And so this farmer was very glad that he had a best friend. Oh, this best friend was by his side, tilling the soil in the hot sun, the torrential rains. And when the harvest came, his best friend would help him carry that load of harvest to the marketplace. Oh, it was such a good friend. He loved his friend dearly, and because it was so wonderful that uh, he called his friend Great Joy, his best friend, Great Joy. And often he would look at his friend in the eyes and just be so filled with acknowledgement. Oh, you are my great joy. I'm so grateful to you. And as best friends do, in that warmth and intimacy of, the, of trusting friendship, his friend would look him in the eye and answer back in the sweet of, a, of his language. <laughs> because his best friend was a, as a beast of burden, an ox that pulled his cart in the, in the, taking all the, the, the harvest to the marketplace. You are my best friend. What would I do without you? Now, as you know, for you who have pets and are very close to your pets, you can look them in the eyes and actually understand what they're saying. And actually beyond this, great joy could talk to his farmer friend. Master, you are kind. I am ever grateful for you. For in the hot blazing sun, you let me roll around in the mud. You let me rest when I am tired. And you make sure you never work me too hard. You are my joy as well. <laughs> well, best friends, I would do anything for you. And I likewise have a special gift for you. A gift? Yes, a boon, a magical wish. In fact, let's make it something like a miracle. And he summoned the farmer close and whispered in his ear and told him that he was to place a bet that the great joy, the ox, could move a cart full of stones, huge boulders. Well, are you sure? Are you sure? And the ox continued, place a bet with the wealthiest merchant in town that you can move the cart of stone. And you, you wage something. Wage, uh, wage half of your farm. Half of my land? No. Trust me, master. Well, the farmer went to the next day, and he talked to the wealthiest man of the village. 
<laughs> you, the sun is, must have gone to your head. <laughs> Half your land and your cart can, your, your ox can move, oh, oh, a thousand pounds, two thousand pounds of rocks and stone. <laughs> well, the deal was sealed. And everyone was abuzz because no ox in town could ever move a, a thousand, if not two thousand, or three thousand pounds of rock. But the next morning, when the farmer led great joy down the road and all the people were running and waiting to see how this would work out, and by the time the farmer reached that crowd, there were a thousand people there. And when the crowd parted, there was a cart full of five thousand pounds of rock. Oh, are you sure? Trust me, master, trust me. And so he hitched up his ox, and the crowd was very excited. They leaned in there, they leaned forward, not in their plastic chairs, but they leaned forward and they said, ooh. Their eyes got big, they say, ah. They really got excited, they say, whoa. And then some of them said, check it out. He hitched that ox, and the ox mulled at his shoulder. Again, the crowd went, ooh. They flexed his muscles. They went, ah. And he rolled his shoulders forward. They went, whoa. But the ox could not move that car. Please, you must do this, or I'll lose half my land. Trust me, master. Trust me. And he, he said, you, you're going to ruin me if I lose half my land. Trust me. And again, the ox strained his muscles. The crowd went, ooh. They said, they went, and then instead of checking it out, some of them slipped into the shadow of their doubts and started to, well, maybe over in this side of the village, they started to snicker with the hee hee hee. And who knows how it spread over to this side of the village? Then he went, no way. And then the middle crowd, they said, impossible. And the crowd started to snicker and snicker with the snickering and the booing and the impossible. You're going to ruin me. You're going to ruin me. And then the farmer picked up his stick and he said, you stupid beast. You stupid. You've ruined me. You stupid idiot beast. And that's when great joy slipped back and stood absolutely still. Rocks and rotten fruit flew down upon them. As the farmer tried to get away, not so fast. Time to pay up. And the deed to half his land was taken. And the farmer went back to his farm, lit a fire, and stared into that fire, looking, thinking about all that he had lost, his land, his land. How could you do this? How? Why did you ruin me? And the ox stepped forward and looked his friend in the eye and said, Why? Why did you call me those names? Why did you treat me so cruelly? Why did you beat me? Have you forgotten my name? And then the farmer felt a shroud of shame. I did forget your name. Your name is... The ox pulled him forward and told him a new plan. And when the farmer heard this, what, what, again? Go back to the, the wealthy man and place another bed on the other half of my land? No, trust me, master. And so, again, the bet was made. The crowd gathered. The wealthy man stood there with a big grin, ready to collect the other deed. <laughs> and he snapped his fingers and the crowd parted. And there was not just one cart full of stone, not just ten carts of stone, but one hundred carts of granite and boulder and stone all the way down the road. One hundred carts of stone. <laughs> Go ahead, begin. And the ox flexed his muscles and the crowd went, ooh. And he bulged his shoulders, they went, ah. And he leaned in forward, and that's when the ox turned to the master and said, what is my name? And the master said in the kindest and sweetest of words, you are my great joy. You are my great joy. Suddenly, it was like a burst of light in every cell of that ox's body. And as he moved forward, suddenly there was a sound. Uh, 
choo, and a boom, and a zoom, zoom, and the hitches, boom, boom, began to snap into place as 100 carts of stone slowly began to inch their way, rolling down the road. And 100 carts of stone rolled down the road, and the crowd went wild. They went, wow! He did it! Yes! And as the crowd threw flowers upon the, the, the winners of this bet, everyone was happy. Uh, well, actually, not everyone. But a deal was sealed. And the farmer went home not just with a cart full of gold, but ten carts full of gold. And that night at the fire, as the farmer looked his best friend in the eyes and nodded, there was a glint of joy in their eyes, not just with their friendship, but from the, the ten carts of gold shimmering in the fire. And then that's when the ox stepped forward and said, all things are possible when you remember the power of great joy. Ready, Joy Boy? We shall. We <laughs> shall carry on. Actually, when he stops making me laugh, that's when he's in trouble. <laughs> okay. In many cultures, there are stories about long hair. Hercules is one of them, yes. Even in the Northwest, among the, the Tlingit and Simshan peoples of the Northwest, salmon woman rubs, runs her hair in a bowl of life, and salmon comes out, the life-giving food of the Northwest nations. And there's Samson and Delilah. Right. So hair has many, many meanings. Life, strength, mm, vitality. And so our story is from China, and it is called The, the Long Haired Girl. Long ago, in ancient China, beside a high mountain nestled in the valley, was a small village that had no water. Now, every day, villagers had to walk miles to the nearest stream to fetch water to bring to their homes. Now, in this village lived a long haired girl whose long raven black hair flowed in the wind, reaching all the way down to her heels. She cared for her sick mother and she raised pigs. And every morning, she walked to the far away stream to fetch the water and then climbed the mountain top to pick herbs for her mother and plants for the pigs. But one day, while in the mountains, she discovered a huge turnip poking its way halfway out of the dirt. Why, this turnip will feed us for weeks. Hmm. E. Yep. R. Soup. Sun. You. Oh, this is going to be delicious. But that was not the real treasure found that day, for out of the hole from which a turnip was pulled gushed a spring of fresh, pure water. Suddenly, whoa, the turnip magically flew out of her hands, stopping the flow of mountain water. But I wanted to taste that water. Hmm. E. Hip. R. Soup. Sun. You. Ah, sweet as the juice of pear. Once again, however, whoa, the turn began, flew out of her hands, stopping the flow of mountain water. And suddenly, a fierce wind lifted the long haired girl, sent her swirling into the mountain cliffs, and she found herself deep in a cave. And standing before was the hairy spirit king of the mountain. You have discovered my spring water. Tell no one about this, or you shall die. But if the waters are allowed to flow through my village, the people will not have to suffer. Silence! Not a word to anyone, or I shall take your life. Now be gone. In an instant, she was at the foot of the mountain. And the long-haired girl hurried home as quickly as she could, careful not to tell the word of the secret to anyone, not even her own mother. For the days that followed, the long-haired girl watched with shame as she saw how far the people still walked to carry the water. And the crops still withered and dried in the fields. And the children still cried from thirst. She wanted so much to tell someone of the secret mountain spring that was shh, so close. High up in the mountain, there is. High up in the mountain. Tell no one. 
or you shall die. There is, I dare not tell. And so she kept the secret deep inside. But because the long-haired girl could see how much the people were suffering, the secret was like a terrible pain in her heart, and the pain grew more terrible each day. And soon the pain began to change her long raven black hair, turning it all brittle, turning it all white. What is wrong with the long-haired girl? Look, her eyes look sad and sunken. Oh, she just stands there muttering to herself. <gasps> look, her long black hair, it turned all white. I think that she is dying. And the long-haired girl was dying. Dying from the truth untold. An old man stumbles, carrying heavy buckets of water. Old man, you've hurt your leg. It is broken. It is bleeding. Oh, it's my fault. What a coward I've been. She could no longer keep the secret inside. She had to tell. Listen, everyone, high up in the mountain, there's a spring of water, fresh and pure. I've seen it with my own eyes. Come, come, listen. High up in the mountain, there's a spring of water, fresh and pure, sweet as the juice of pear. Come, I'll take you there. When they reached the place of the spring water, the turnip was pulled, chopped into pieces, the hole was widened. And out gushed the sweetest water, tumbling all the way down to the village. Oh, look, look. We no longer have to walk miles. <laughs> Where's the long-haired girl? Uh oh, she's probably gone ahead of us down the mountainside to tell her mother the good news of the spring water in the mountains. But this was not so. <laughs> You have told the secret of my mountain spring. Now you must die. I, I shall gladly die for the sake of my people. You will be placed under the tumbling waters. I shall gladly place my body under the waters. Suffering a slow and cold death. So that the waters can bring life to my village. Shh. But first, may I please return home just once more to care for my mother? Uh, all right. You may go home for your, to your mother for just one day. But if you do not return to me, I shall find a way to stop up the spring order and kill all the people. And when you return, place yourself under the tumbling waters all by yourself. And do not bother me again. Now be gone. Once again, the long-haired girl found herself at the foot of the mountain. There were She hurried gardens. home. So she hurried home. What? She hurried home to her mother. New crops were being planted. Green and lush. Where children were played in splashing waters. Children laughing and splashing. She ran all the way home to her mother. And when she got home, she told her mother the good news of the spring water in the mountains. And lifting a cup of its refreshing waters to her lips, she spoke. Mother. Now that the waters have come to the village, I have time to uh, uh, visit my friends on the other side of the mountain for a few days. Uh, you'll be safe. I've asked the neighbors to watch over you while I'm gone. We'll both be fine. Quickly she turned to hide her tears. I'm going now, Mother. Halfway up the mountain, the long-haired girl stopped to rest under the shade of a tall tree overlooking the valley. She wished to take one last look at the village transformed by the secret mountain spring oh, water. I, sh I shall miss all of you so much. Psst. Huh? Who are you? Psst. Where are you going, long-haired girl? Why, little man. Uh, you have green hair, a green beard, and you're just all in green. Why? <laughs> because uh, I'm the green man. Who else? <laughs> And you're a kind girl. I've been watching you for a long time. Don't worry, no one's going to harm you. Come, come, come with me. Come with me, look and see. I have been carving a statue of stone. A statue girl to look exactly like you. <laughs> we shall take the stone image 
Place it under the tumbling waters. Oh, the spirit king, he won't know the difference between you and a statue girl of stone. <laughs> but the statue needs one last touch. Your long, white hair. E our sons. Wow. The moment that little man placed the hair upon the head of the statue, it took root and then began to grow. She then watched the little man carry the statue up the mountainside, place it under a torrent of water, the water mingling with the long, white hair. Suddenly, whoa, oh, oh, look, look, my hair, it is growing. Long hair girl, we have tricked the spirit king of the mountain. You can go home now, go home. So she ran all the way down the mountain. Home to her mother. To the green and lush village. Past all the children laughing and splashing. Her long raven black hair flowing in the wind. Reaching all the way down to her heels. Yeah. <sighs>